Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. We'll start with uh, the next topic. So, in the last class, we looked at uh, extracellular matrices, right? So, we primarily talked about how extracellular matrices can actually be used for tissue engineering applications, where we talked about uh, what are the components and uh, we discussed what the structures are and what their roles in the ECM are. So, we'll move on to other materials which can be used as scaffolds. So, first, we will talk about natural polymers today. So, I have also uploaded the slides for the last lecture and I have actually edited it to give an older paper rather than the, a newer paper. So, what I did was I went back and looked at the papers and I realized that uh, the older paper had a more detailed uh, materials and methods section. So, I have put the older paper, it is a 2008 paper, uh, it is about uh, decellularizing a heart and they have given an extensive uh, de extensive details on the protocol. I think I have also uploaded the reading material for the protocols, if not I will upload that, uh, if you want, if you are interested you can look it up, I will give that to you. So, the group had actually published uh, a protocols paper. So, people tend to do that when they have some innovative protocol. So, they will give the standard operating procedure for a protocol, step by step it will be described. So, that will help you uh, with your questions, you are asking how exactly decellularization is done and the protocols paper actually would say every step that can be done so that it can actually be reproducible. Okay, now, uh, we will talk about the next class of materials which is uh, studied for scaffolds, it is the natural polymers. So, you have uh, different types of natural polymers which are commonly used. So, we will talk about what they are and how they are used in tissue engineering. So, a natural polymer is something which is derived from a renewable resources which could be plants, animals or microorganisms. They are complex structures with different physiological functions. So, depending on uh, which organism they are found in, they would have their own physiological functions. Some of their properties are that they would have pseudoplastic behavior, they would have good gelation ability and the water binding capacity, they would most commonly be biodegradable, not always. Uh, so, it will usually be degradable in the organism which we are looking at, but if you are trying to going to say in humans, not all of them are going to be biodegradable. So, they may possess many functional groups which can be used for chemical or enzymatic modifications or conjugation of other biomolecules. So, which is an important property you would want in a base material because you want to impart bioactivity to the material. So, the base material you use should have functional groups to which you can actually conjugate these molecules. So, uh, advantage of using something like a natural polymer would be it can interact favorably with cells through specific recognition domains because they do tend to interact with cells in the host organism where they are present. So, they have uh, domains which will help in that. And if it is a molecule which is already present in your human body, then it can actually very nicely integrate and interact with the human body as well. So, hybrid materials uh, have been used to mimic ECM. So, basically you take two or three natural uh, polymers and blend them or conjugate them in a way that it would form something which would uh, chemically be similar to ECM. So, these kinds of research has been done extensively over the past 20 or 30 years. And there has been uh, varying levels of success with doing this. So, the limitation would be they can be degraded uh, by naturally occurring enzymes, which means controlling their uh, rate of degradation becomes a challenge. So, if it is something which uh, is going to have a, if you are going to put it in a wound site, for example, you are going to have some uh, matrix metalloproteases there, which can actually degrade some of these uh, compounds. So, you would want to uh, 
um, cross link them in a way that they do not get degraded more rapidly than your desired rate of degradation right so that would be a challenge uh, when it comes to this so another problem would be an undesirable immune response uh, due to the presence of impurities or endotoxins because you are going to be many a times extracting it from another place so there can always be some amount of endotoxins uh, remaining even if it is a bacterial culture you can still have some of the bacterial cell wall or something which is remaining after purification which can trigger immune reactions and lead to rejection of the implant. Uh, another problem is their property can actually vary from batch to batch depending on where you actually get the material from you will have a different uh, molecular weight, different uh, uh, functionality and so on. So it will be, it, it can actually be a problem if you are looking for consistency with every step it will be a problem. With synthetic polymers you would not have that right, you have control over the chemical synthesis which is happening. So you can control their uh, molecular weight and other properties to a very large extent whereas that is not possible with uh, natural polymers. So natural polymers are actually classified to 8 major classes based on chemical structures. So polysaccharides, proteins, polyoxoesters, polythioesters, polyanhydrides, polyisoprenoids and uh, poly lignin sorry in lignin and uh, nucleic acids are the 8 classes. So out of these polysaccharides and proteins have actually been extensively studied because those are the components which are present in your ECM right. So they have actually been explored in depth. So the uh, polyoxoesters uh, which would be the polyhydroxy alkanoic acids uh, have also been studied to a reasonable level they have because they can actually be synthesized by bacterial uh, root so by bacterial fermentation. So that is also that has also generated some amount of interest in this domain. So uh, in today's lecture we will talk about polysaccharides and uh, only about proteins that we did not look at as part of ECM right. So uh, I do not want to again talk about collagen and say that collagen can be used right. So <laughs> I am not going to do that but obviously collagen is something people do use. So please remember that uh, although I am not talking about it here it is a natural polymer which is being used in tissue engineering applications. So are other things like elastin, laminin and all that we will not go into details of those aspects. Uh, we will talk about polysaccharides because we have not talked about them primarily when we talked about ECM and we will also uh, have a small introduction on what uh, polyhydroxy alkanoic acids are. So natural polymers can actually be when, where you get it is basically isolate from plant or animal sources you can also get it from algae. So sometimes uh, microorganisms which are capable of producing these uh, polysaccharides can be cultured or you can use it in fermentation processes and uh, produce these. So uh, biopolymer production by fermentation has actually been uh, a growing field. So people try to use microbial cultures to produce different types of uh, polysaccharides. So cellulose is one common example where bacterial cellulose has been extensively studied. Uh, in our own uh, department uh, Professor uh, Guhan Jayaraman works on developing uh, metabolically engineered strains for producing hyaluronic acid. So uh, there are different ways people do it and there are also enzymatic processes which can be used uh, as fermentation process instead of using the whole microbe people can try to use enzymatic processes for uh, creating these polymers. So there are different such uh, processes which are studied for so many different uh, materials and uh, you are ultimately looking to get consistency. So this kind of a fermentation where you may have better control over the production uh, can limit the batch to batch variations which you are uh, always worried about. So we will first start talking about uh, polysaccharides. Uh, so they are also known as glycans. Polysaccharides are nothing but uh, bunches of monosaccharides which are linked together. The monosaccharides could be aldoses or ketoses and uh, they are linked by uh, glycosidic linkages and monosaccharides are basically classified based on uh, the number of carbons. So you would have triose, tetrose, pentose, hexose, heptose, octose and nonose and so on. So these are the monosaccharides which are the building blocks for the polysaccharides. Uh, polysaccharides can be classified uh, based on the composition of monosaccharides as uh, homopolysaccharides or heteropolysaccharides. Homopolysaccharide would basically have only one um, monosaccharide as a repeating unit, a heteropolysaccharide would have multiple uh, monosaccharides as repeating units 
it can also be classified based on the structure whether it is a linear chain or a branch chain. So, if you have a branch chain then uh, it can have better mechanical properties in some cases. So, uh, but the degradability will probably be uh, lesser when you have a branch chain. So, you would have to find uh, optimal levels for using in your application. So, there are different uh, factors which affect the physical property of a polysaccharide. Uh, obviously, the monosaccharide composition is one thing. So, you can also have linkage types and patterns, chain shapes uh, like the linear chain or branch chain and so on and the molecular weight of the material itself. So, you, you might have these polysaccharides which can start from maybe 50, 40, 50 kilo daltons to all the way to a few mega daltons. So, if you are going to have that kind of a range based on the molecular weight there will be many physical properties which will change. So, this is the general structure of a polysaccharide. Uh, so, you have uh, what you look at here is there are different uh, monosaccharide compositions that can be there and you also have different linkage patterns. So, you have 1, 6 glycosidic bond here, you have the O glycosidic linkage general and uh, beta 1, 4 glycosidic bond and so on and uh, you can also have uh, different substitutions uh, for the in the position of the um, hydroxyl group. So, you have a hydroxyl group here. So, here you can have different substitutions with, uh, with the R which could be any group and you can also uh, have different degrees of freedom uh, because of these glycosidic bonds. So, this will create uh, this is a general structure and uh, you can actually keep changing this based on the groups which are there and the monomers which are there you will get the different polymer structures, so different polysaccharide structures. So, uh, we will start with alginate. So, alginate is something all of you are aware of right. So, you would have used it even if not for biomedical applications you would have done it used it in uh, some say en enzyme entrapment, entrapment experiment. So, you would have always taken uh, alginate solution in uh, sodium salts and then mixed it with calcium chloride to get alcium beads uh, sorry alginate beads. So, uh, these are very commonly used uh, in uh, different applications. So, biomedical applications also they started looking at this for uh, for uh, cell encapsulation and techniques like that. So, alginate is basically a polysaccharide which is uh, derived from C algae and uh, this is a linear block uh, copolymers of 1,4 linked uh, beta D manuronic acid and alpha L uh, guluronic acid. The divalent ions uh, can actually form cross links in alginates by binding to the guluronic residues. So, what happens is during gelation and cross linking uh, the sodium ions which are there uh, get replaced with the calcium ions and uh, results in the formation of something like the egg box structure which is shown here. So, these links which are separate then get cross linked because of the presence of the calcium groups uh, the calcium ions results in the formation of uh, cross linking and thereby it forms a uh, strong gel. So, uh, the advantage of something like an alginate uh, cross linking is uh, it is relatively inert uh, aqueous environment. So, you do not really need um, harsh conditions to create these kinds of cross linking which means it would be conducive for uh, biological materials like cells and enzymes and so on. It also has very high gel porosity. So, it is a very porous gel which means so there can be very good mass transport. So, uh, that means material can actually come in and leave. So, cells which are entrapped would actually get enough nutrients to survive in uh, when encapsulated by cal calcium alginate beads. So, uh, as I said mild, mild encapsulation process which is also free of organic solvents makes it conducive for uh, biological applications. So, this is used for uh, encapsulation of cells people have studied encapsulating different types of cells using uh, calcium alginate so that they can deliver cells to a site and other bioactive agents uh, you can try to load the growth factors and other molecules also using these uh, cross linking agents. So, uh, cross link the uh, alginate can actually immobilize and also later recover cells from uh, the cell culture matrix. And it is because of this it has been used in uh, delivering cells basically it is used as a vehicle for uh, delivering cell, uh, encapsulated cells. So, people have tried to use uh, alginate beads as a bioartificial matrix for cartilage uh, regeneration 
and also for uh, engineering liver tissues. So there are different papers on these, I am not going to go into the details of each of these things, I am just telling you these are the applications which are which have been used. So you can always go back and uh, refer to literature, try to figure out uh, how exactly people have used this. So obviously most of these would not just be taking alginate and using it, there will be some level of modification, some other com uh, polymers being blended and so on. So you would want to go back and read, read up on that uh, if you are interested, okay. But uh, just as a introduction for you to understand that this can be used, this is sufficient. So as I said, it is commonly used as a composite with other polymers and also with ceramics for tissue engineering applications. See most of the polymers uh, will always be tried uh, blended with ceramics when they want to use it for bone tissue engineering because the polymers themselves will not have the desired um, bioactivity and the mechanical property. So you try to blend them to form uh, composites with ceramics. So dextran is another bacterial derived uh, polysaccharide. So you have uh, alpha 1,6 linked uh, D-glucopyranose residues with a, a small percentage of uh, alpha 1,2, alpha 1,3 and alpha 1,4 linked side chains. So this is uh, the structure of uh, dextran, dextran is commonly used uh, for different applications. So can you think of a common application where dextran is used, alginate you all know, similarly you have also used dextran somewhere, not in obviously not medical you would not probably think of that but I am talking about something where uh, some experiment that you might have done. Protein purification, uh, cephadex, cephadex is actually made of dextran, so okay. So uh, dextran hydrogels are, can be created either by physical or chemical cross-linking uh, taking advantage of the, all the hydroxyl groups that are present. See as you see here, uh, the structure shows a lot of hydroxyl groups that are present, right. So you have hydroxyl groups everywhere. So because there are so many hydroxyl groups, it is actually easy to cross-link them. Uh, you can actually have simple hydrogen bonding as physical cross-linking to form nice hydrogels. So we will talk about what hydrogels are and how they are formed in a later lecture. So right now I am just talking about the materials that can be used and then we will talk about how they are being fabricated during that time we will talk about hydrogels, okay. So uh, these are widely used in separation matrices uh, which is the cephadex, cephadex is one uh, common example where dextran is used. Uh, it is also used as cell microcarriers, uh, it is a commercial product called Cytodex is uses for uh, cell delivery. It has also been explored as drug delivery vehicles. So uh, this uh, dextran has actually shown that it has very good uh, uh, hemocompatibility. So it has been used for reducing vascular thrombosis and uh, reducing inflammatory responses or to prevent uh, ischemia and uh, reperf reperfusion injury during organ transplant. So dextran actually has been extensively used in biomedical applications even before tissue engineering. So because there is uh, so much promise and biocompa with biocompatibility, people have tried to explore dextran for uh, tissue engineering applications as well. So another polymer which is very commonly used, studied is chitosan, right. So I think just behind collagen, chitosan is the uh, highest uh, researched material. So if you search for uh, publications related to chitosan and tissue engineering, you would find thousands of them. So there are actually many studies which have uh, worked extensively on uh, chitosan uh, simply because it has very similar structure to naturally occurring uh, glycosaminoglycans in humans and it is a lot easier to get compared to other uh, polysaccharides which are not readily available. Hyaluronic acid you can get it, hyaluronan you get it, but hyaluronan, uh, do you know where you get hyaluronan from? If you have attended seminars from Guhan's lab you would know. Hyaluronan is uh, actually taken from uh, rooster comb, so <laughs> you, you can imagine the quantity you would actually be able to get from that, right. It is not very easy to get that, it is extraction process quite uh, painful. There are also commercial processes where um, streptomyces is being used for production of hyaluronan. Uh, Professor Guhan's lab works on uh, being you trying to use lactococcus for production because you know, I don't you know they use streptococcus, not streptomyces. Streptococcus is used in commercial cases, I think. 
but uh, lactococcus is uh, a grass strain compared to streptococcus. So, he they are working on uh, trying to use lactococcus. So, anyways, so uh, chitosan is not like that, chitosan is actually found in uh, arthropod ex exoskeletons and fungal cell walls. So, you can actually very easily get chitosan, right. So, uh, all the shrimp shell which you throw away uh, has chitosan. So, it's, it's, it has chitin and chitin can be processed to get chitosan. So, because of this there is actually uh, a lot of abundance uh, when it comes to chitosan. Because of this it is actually reasonably uh, inexpensive. Uh, it is also biodegradable, bioadhesive and biocompatible. So, for these reasons people have actually explored uh, chitosan extensively and it is basically a linear polysaccharide of 1,4 uh, linked uh, glucosamine and n acetyl glucosamine. So, the molecular weight you get can actually range anywhere from 50 kilo daltons to 1000 kilo daltons uh, and also you have uh, deacetylation of these uh, chitin. Chitin is acetylated. So, when you deacetylate chitin, you get chitosan, and the degree of deacetylation can vary from 50 to 90 percent. So, it is a semi crystalline polymer, and uh, the degree of crystallinity is actually a function of the degree of acetylation, deacetylation. So, uh, it is actually very high at both 0 degree, de 0 percent deacetylation and 100 percent deacetylation. On in between, it is a very semi crystalline material. So, as I said it is a biodegradable material because it gets degraded by lysozyme. So, ly uh, lysozyme basically uh, cleaves the uh, glycosidic bonds and degrades the chitosan. So, the kinetics is inversely uh, related to the degree of deacetylation. So, higher the degree of deacetylation lower will be the degradability. So, it is soluble in aqueous, it is insoluble in aqueous solutions above pH of 7. Uh, and it is fully soluble in dilute acids with pH less than 5. So, you can uh, you can increase temperature, you can play around with the solubility conditions to dissolve it even around neutral pH. Uh, it shows a cationic nature and uh, has a high charge density in solution. So, these are the major properties of chitosan and uh, this chitosan molecule is actually uh, cross linked when you want to prepare gels. So, there are different ways you can cross link it. So, glutaraldehyde is a very common cross linking agent uh, which is used extensively for uh, cross linking because it has two aldehyde groups right. So, you can easily form cross links. So, uh, genipin is another cross linking molecule which has also been used. Uh, UV irradiation and thermal variations can actually cause physical cross linking. So, these are some of the techniques which are used for cross linking. And uh, chitosan is primarily um, processed using uh, freeze drying technique to prepare uh, scaffolds. So, uh, what is freeze drying? Lyophilization. Okay, that is another name for freeze drying. <laughs> what is the process? Like the water molecules get sublimed, leaving the solid state. Okay. So, uh, what happens is you basically reduce that pressure enough so that water does not have to evaporate, but it just sublimes, the ice just sublimes to form a water vapor. So, the advantage of doing something like this is uh, you would be able to create pores. So, the ice which is there, if it immediately goes into vapor phase, the uh, space occupied by the ice is going to be left empty, leaving pores. So, these porous structures uh, are going to provide the porosity for the cells to attach and grow. So, that is one uh, use of doing lyophilization. So, that is why people try to lyophilize scaffolds when they prepare it. Chitosan has been used in different tissue engineering applications. Uh, it is uh, identified as one of the most promising natural origin polymers for tissue engineering applications. So, uh, it has been looked at for different tissue engineering things. So, bone it probably uh, primarily is used along with some ceramics uh, because using, just using chitosan is probably not good enough for uh, the mechanical properties. But it has been used for a lot of soft tissue applications. Again, uh, it would be blended with other materials, composites would be prepared. So, uh, all the materials we talk about are pure components, free of polysaccharides and proteins which we are talking about. But uh, current research almost always uses composites. You would almost never see just one material being used and that is because your um, ECM itself is not a single material, right. It is a mixture of things. So, you would not want to, if you are trying to emulate and mimic the ECM, 
you cannot just use one material and uh, think that will actually give you the exact property of the ECM. So, it does not work that way. Okay. So, uh, different things which people have worked on are uh, skin, neural, ligament, uh, liver and tracheal uh, tissue engineering. So, cellulose is uh, another molecule which people try to work on. So, this is one of the non-biodegradable molecules in the sense that it is not degradable in your body. Uh, you can use cellulase to degrade it if you are if the organism has cellulase you can it can degrade it, but we do not and it cannot be degraded in vivo in humans. So, it is the main component of plant cell walls and uh, it is the most abundant and renewable polymer resource available. Uh, it is primarily available as lignocellulosic material. So, you would have to separate the lignin from uh, the cellulose to use it for many of the applications. So, which in itself is a big challenge there are actually extensive research going on about uh, how to separate lignin from uh, lignocellulosic material. So, uh, this uh, basically has a linear polymer consisting of the D glucose residues which are linked by uh, beta 1 4 glycosidic bonds. So, uh, what happens is uh, these chains are actually stabilized by the formation of uh, the beta linked uh, glucopyranose residues. And once uh, these chains are stabilized then the flexibility of the material decreases and these chains can actually form hydrogen bonds amongst each other to form uh, microfibrils giving it the mechanical strength and the chemical stability. So, that is why it is um, very strong it is actually a very mechanically strong material. Cellulose in tissue engineering uh, people have tried to use it for different tissue engineering applications although it is not degradable. Uh, people have actually seen that uh, partial degradation can be obtained uh, in vivo. So, there are some literature which suggests uh, partial degradation, but uh, there are no hydrolases in your body which can actually degrade these linkages and therefore, it is non degradable in vivo. So, um, people have tried to use this for bone tissue engineering and shown that uh, cell cellulose actually supports bone ingrowth and also uh, induces cell migration. So, showing some kind of bioactivity when it comes uh, when it is used for bone applications. Uh, cardiac tissue engineering uh, applications have been shown to have promise because they show cell growth connectivity and also some electrical functionality while uh, using cellulose as the major component of the ECM of the scaffold. Uh, people have used it for cartilage tissue engineering. So, bacterial cellulose have been has been shown to support proliferation of bovine derived uh, chondrocytes. So, again these are all preliminary studies uh, so some of them would be only in vitro studies some of them would probably be uh, some small animal studies it is not like they have actually taken it for commercialization. So, please do not think that oh these are all things which are completely proven no it is actually just initial studies have shown this is what uh, its properties are and uh, there is always uh, a chance of failure at different levels right. So, so uh, starch is another carbohydrate molecule which is actually a carbohydrate reserve for higher plants and uh, it is one of the cheapest biomaterials available that is also biodegradable. Uh, it is completely degradable to form uh, carbon dioxide and water. So, because of this it is an interesting material to work with. Uh, it basically contain, contains alpha D glucose units that can be organized as uh, amylose and amylopectin. Amylose is a linear uh, very sparsely branched uh, polymer which is linked by 1,4 uh, glycosidic bonds and you have amylopectin which is a highly branched polymer that contains 1,4 bonds and 1,6 branching points and it appears for every 25 to 30 glucose units. So, because of this the structure itself is reasonably uh, branched when you are talking about uh, starch. So, again again starch has also been used in different applications I have not gone into the details starch has actually been used along with uh, other molecules other polymers uh, for using uh, for showing some uh, tissue engineering applications. Uh, hyaluronan uh, is a highly hydrophilic uh, polysaccharide. So, amongst the polymers which we have discussed till now hyaluronan is the only polymer which is actually present in your body right you, sorry. Sir what made researchers think that starch could be used for tissue It is biocompatible. So, see anytime a material is biocompatible you might want to explore its potential right. So, 
if it is not biocompatible it cannot be used at all right. So, when you test know that it is a biocompatible material and it is completely degradable uh, it is you know for sure it is not going to cause any harm. So, you want to see whether it can have desired functionalities when people explore sometimes you see desired functionalities sometimes you do not and in some cases there will be uh, positive results during in vitro studies which will get published. But eventually when you take it further you would realize at some point it its application has to st stop because you cannot take it further for uh, a clinical application. So, I do not know I do not even think 1 percent of uh, whatever is reported as publications can actually be translated to clinical uh, products right. So, it is, uh, you would see publications on every application uh, you will see thousands of publications on bone tissue engineering thousands on uh, cart cartilage tissue engineering and you probably have like 3 products in each <laughs> and that is because it is not going to translate that well there is going to be a lot of uh, hiccups. And most of the times what happens is people study things in vitro right. So, uh, when you study in vitro many a times you also use uh, cell lines instead of using primary cells. So, you are going to have differences uh, from cell line to primary cell and then into a small animal and then you take it to a large animal and then to humans there is just so much chance of failure from uh, what is published to what is actually becoming a clinical product. But it is important to explore every material which has a potential to become a clinical product. That is why people who work in this domain will always start with anything they believe is biocompatible right. So, that is why in our lab we started working on ISAP goal right. ISAP goal pretty much nobody had worked on. Uh, so, it is a polysaccharide it is used primarily for as a food supplement. So, uh, you use it uh, so you might have heard satisab or uh, metamucil. So, these are products which you can buy off the shelf it is very cheap and uh, it is soluble in water and people just dissolve it in water and drink it it is a dietary supplement uh, it, it is a fiber supplement actually. So, in our lab we just started to decided we will use it and see what happens right. and it showed some positive results obviously we have a long way to go whether to know whether it can be taken much farther. So, similarly glucomannan so many things are being studied because they are uh, they show promise not because we know for sure it will work in the final stages. Okay. So, uh, and here I am only talking about materials which have been reasonably well studied okay. there will always be thousands of papers where thousands of different materials have been explored. Uh, I cannot actually go into details of all of them it is not practical. Uh, you can go and look up uh, biopolymer tissue engineering and you will probably get like 20,000 hits <laughs> and I am pretty sure not all of them will fall within the uh, 6 or 7 materials which I have identified right. So, people work on so many different things we will try to use so many different sources for things and uh, see even if I am going to use um, the same uh, material. So, a glucomannan is a glucomannan, but uh, it does not always behave that way. Uh, because it, if it comes from one plant it could be have a certain property compared to another plant. So, then you have to look at what would be the effects of using that separately. So, you would have different studies. So, uh, hyaluronan is uh, a component is a key component in your ECM it has a lot of biological functionality. So, it makes sense to try to use it for your uh, tissue engineering applications. So, it is a large negatively charged linear polysaccharide made of uh, repeating disaccharide units uh, containing uh, glucuronic acid and acetyl glucosamine N acetyl glucosamine. So, this can be degraded in your body by the action of hyaluronidase and uh, because of this it is degradable and it is not a problem you can use it for uh, any tissue engineering application. So, people have shown that it has very desirable bioactivities uh, it can stimulate uh, bone marrow stromal cells proliferation and differentiation. Uh, it also interacts with cell surfaces people have understood how it interacts with cell surfaces there are actually two ways one is by binding through uh, surface receptors CD44 and uh, RHAM. So, RHAM is uh, some hyaluronic acid mediated uh, migration or something. So, uh, and uh, this receptor for hyaluronic acid mediated migration that is what it is and uh, it also has uh, sustained uh, transmembrane interactions with its synthetases. So, because of these things it can actually uh, interact very nicely with cells 
and it will help the cells to attach to the surface. So, it, this is commonly present in your synovial fluid joints uh, of joints, umbilical cords and uh, vitreous body of the eye and so on. So, hyaluronic acid is very commonly seen in these applications, in these parts of your body. Uh, it has also uh, been proven to be involved in the embryonic lung, lung development, uh, angiogenesis, wound healing and inflammatory process. So, because you have uh, the understanding of where it is used, you try to design tissue engineering applications where you can actually use this. So, this HA is primarily most commonly used in combination with other polymers. Uh, it, like uh, it, it could be fibrin glue, alginate, chitosan, PEG, collagen, elastin, PLGA, laminin, many different things. So, HA is just a component along with it and it has been shown to be effective for uh, cartilage, skin, trachea, eye, uh, vascular uh, applications and osteochondral applications and so on. So, it has been shown to be uh, reasonably effective for these things as a blend or in combination with other polymers. So, uh, these are the polysaccharides. So, then the other class which I said is proteins. So, I am not going to go into collagen, uh, elastin, laminin which we dealt with in reasonable detail uh, as part of extracellular matrix. So, we will talk about uh, other proteins which are used. So, here I have only about silk fibroin, there are other proteins as well which are used. So, keratins is one example, keratins have uh, cell adhesion sites uh, which help in uh, cell attachment. So, because of this keratins have also been studied. So, keratins from different sources like from human hair, from uh, sheep wool and so on have been studied for tissue engineering applications. So, uh, silk fibroin I am talking about here because it is one of the more uh, extensively studied molecules. So, there are uh, a few groups uh, within our own country and in the world which have focused primarily on silk fibroin for different biomedical applications. Uh, Professor S. C. Kundu and uh, his student uh, Biman Mandal uh, are people who have been working extensively on uh, silk fibroin in our country and uh, Professor David Kaplan is a uh, person who has been working on silk fibroin in the US and these people have actually been working on it for maybe a few decades now and uh, they have actually explored so many different avenues for silk uh, when it comes to tissue engineering. So, uh, silk uh, it is a highly fibrous, it is a highly insoluble fibrous protein that is produced by silkworms. So, Bombix Mori uh, silk fibroin is what has been mm, extensively studied, uh, but uh, Professor Kundu and uh, Biman Mandal here are also working on something which is uh, native to India which is a non-mulberry silkworm. So, they work on non-mulberry silkworms and see how the, uh, the silk fibroin of that is uh, applicable for tissue engineering applications. So, 90 percent of the amino acids are uh, glycine, alanine or serine. And uh, these have anti parallel beta pleated sheets uh, which form the fibers. And actually, the silk uh, co contains two proteins one is fibroin, which is a structural protein of silk, and you also have another material which is uh, sericin. Sericin is a water soluble uh, glue like protein that binds uh, fibroin fibers together. So, sericin is usually removed before you use uh, fibroin for uh, tissue engineering applications because uh, sericin can cause thrombogenic uh, and inflammatory responses. So, and removing it is quite simple because sericin is water soluble and uh, fibroin is not, all you do is just put it in water and boil it. So, sericin will get dissolved and fibroin will remain, you take out the fibroin. And uh, this has been used for many tissue engineering applications, again in uh, in combination with other materials. So, uh, recently within the last few years, it has been shown to have uh, proangiogenic properties and they have actually established the mechanism through which silk can actually, uh, silk fibroin can actually provide proangiogenic properties. And this really uh, widens the horizon for the field uh, for this material because you can now use it uh, in uh, along with other materials where you want revascularization to happen. So, the other class, last class of materials uh, which is the uh, polyhydroxy alkanoids uh, are natural biodegradable polymers which are synthesized by bacteria. Uh, these are used as uh, carbon and energy reserves. The first PHA to be identified was uh, polyhydroxybutyrate which is also called as PHB 
and uh, these have been explored for various tissue engineering applications. Uh, these, uh, this is right now a lot of work is being done on uh, fermentation processes for producing uh, PHBs and uh, the other types of PHAs as well. Okay, so, you can look up what is all about going on in this domain. So, for this chapter, this is the for this lecture, this is the reference I had used. Uh, this is a chapter from a book called Tissue Engineering. So, it was edited by a bunch of people, and the authors for this chapter was also a bunch of people. So, uh, the chapter is called Natural Polymers in Tissue Engineering Applications. Okay. <coughs>